you know, people that have listened to me in the past have heard me talk about the bid for passive and the structural dynamics of money flowing into 401ks. And I just want to emphasize and highlight for people that we're actually now starting to see what I was worried about, which is the signs that the market is hitting a point at which the flows into these strategies are beginning to slow and turn negative. There are things that can be done, right? The U.S. government could decide, okay, we're going to give $10,000 to each person to save in the stock market. I guarantee you that you're going to hear proposals like that floated over the next couple of years with the objective being to make everything better, right? The lobbying coming from Vanguard, BlackRock at all mm -hmm. is very much in that direction. Um, whether we see that or not, I, I can't possibly know, but we are running out of games that we can play. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. The officially reported headline GDP, jobs, and inflation numbers look pretty rosy right now. But how much of that is due to actual, healthy, sustainable economic activity versus extraordinary government intervention? Deficit spending as a percentage of GDP is currently at heights not seen outside of major war times, and government jobs have surged. Total federal employment reached its highest level in at least 20 years last year. Is the government putting its thumb on the scale here? And if so, is that a good or bad thing? To discuss, we're fortunate to be joined by Michael Green, Portfolio Manager and Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Adam. Thank you for having me. Oh, gosh. It's always wonderful to have you on the program. Mike, I feel comfortable saying this. You are one of the most intellectually sharp guys that I get the chance to talk to. So it's always a pleasure. I'm going to do my best to just hang on to this conversation by my fingernails, as I normally do when we talk. Um, lots of questions for you. Um, lots of, I think, are pretty important questions for you. But before we dig into them specifically, I'd just like to ask the general question. I like to kick these interviews off with, what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Um, well, I think the two are related, but not in quite the same manner that everybody thinks they are. So um, if I think about the global economy, I think the notable characteristic is, is that we're dealing with many of the aspects of the post-pandemic environment. Um, governments have taken on an incredible amount of debt and increased fiscal responsibility. Uh, that's particularly true in the United States, but also true around the world. We're seeing deficits higher than we would expect or higher than they're supposed to be in, in Europe, Japan, uh, China, certainly, et cetera. Um, the markets, I think, unfortunately, are a little disconnected from uh, the underlying economic data because of things I've been on your programs and talked about in the past, things like passive investment have changed markets from being what I would describe as a thoughtful discounting mechanism for future economic activity, and instead largely turn them into flow machines that are tied to the employment of, uh, in particular, Americans, but increasingly others around the globe, who are contributing on a regular basis as long as they're employed to things like 401k or IRA programs, and typically buying passive strategies that are market cap weighted um, and I think, unfortunately, that leads to distortions that in turn fe create feedback loops um, on the policy side that can be very, very confusing, right? If we were to look at the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, we would say, my gosh, the economy is among the best we've ever seen. If we were to look at unemployment levels, we would say they're remarkably low. But if we dig into each of those and we look at the underlying characteristic, you know, there's very, very few stocks that have actually made new all-time highs since the levels that we saw in 2021. So we're now almost three years in metrics like the Russell 2000, for example, where the majority of stocks are actually down over the last three years, as crazy as that sounds, while the equity markets are perceived as near all-time highs. Um, similar dynamics, I think, unfortunately, play through in the employment markets where we've seen the unemployment rate begin to rise for those that are being negatively affected by unskilled immigration, uh, we're seeing labor mar markets begin to loosen up at the lower end of the scale. And then the other thing that we're really seeing, and I think ChatGPT and, and the AIs are providing some cover for this type of stuff, but we're actually starting to see signs of oversupply in the quote unquote skilled area of the market, those with college degrees, et cetera. It doesn't seem like this is possibly true when we look at aggregate unemployment near lows, 
But the unemployment rate for those with college degrees, for example, has basically doubled over the last 20 years, suggesting that we're kind of beginning to run into either um, oversupply in those categories or that the value of those degrees is beginning to deteriorate relative to what we'd seen historically. And so I'm, I'm overall quite cautious that the data sets, while they you know, would suggest that things are really positive in both financial markets and in labor markets, one, I think the two are linked in a way that is not about discounting future economic outcomes. And two, I think that there are some rumbling signs that areas of the economy that have powered growth, in particular things like the services economy, in financial services, technology, et cetera, that those are beginning to encounter some headwinds. And I'm not entirely sure what we do next is, is you know, the summary of that long-winded diatribe. All right. Um... So I take a number of, of things away from this. Um, one is, is that, yes, it sort of sounds like in general, you're saying government is putting its its thumb on the scale to a certain extent um, with the increase in debt and fiscal deficits and some of the policies that have morphed based upon how things have changed here. Um, you're worried about, uh, or, or sorry, you're, you're taking note, I'll say, of the what you see as a potential loosening um, in, in, in the labor market right now. Um, and that's really interesting because that has long been looked at as a bulwark standing between the rosy numbers and not the soft landing, but the hard landing. Um, so I want to ask you in a bit, um, you know, where you think that's likely headed and what would happen if, if that bulwark really indeed yeah. started to crack. Um, I, I want to get to, I, I want to ask two really important things you mentioned I want to ask you sort of the same question on which is um can the yeah like can these sustain can these continue so first off I, I asked this question just twice this past week to both Lacey Hunt and to Sven Henrik and I want to ask it to you so we're now in this new world where the governments have gotten a lot more involved they've been intervening a lot more um and deficit spending as you said is something that we're seeing um rise to elevated levels not just in the U.S. but elsewhere and it's kind of become business as usual in the US at least. Um, so the question is, is if indeed that's really the case, are we able to, are we gonna be able to dial that back down at some point? Or is the system now so getting so acclimated to this excessive uh, you know, juicing that, from no. the deficit side yeah. that, there, that, that even just politically, that there's no room for somebody to stand up and say, well, you know, now's the time where we get to start tightening our belt. You know, we've been spending more than we should. We get to dial it back down. Is is the political appetite out there for that now? Or is, is that now politically untouchable? Well, I, I think, you know, we're clearly actually trying to create that appetite. Unfortunately, it's harder to do than we would expect. So um, when you talk about dynamics like the high levels of deficits that we're encountering, Part of that is by choice, right? Hiking interest rate policy has significantly contributed to a pro-cyclical deficit that was not anticipated, right? Um, we've moved, and I know that people look at current levels of interest rates, they're like, they're so low relative to what I remember when I started working. Um, you, you know, I think it's really important for people to recognize that we're actually looking at real yields that are quite high in an environment in which there's an incredible amount of debate around whether we can actually sustain those real yields. Right. Um, you know, Because the, the debt mountain is just so much higher than people remember back in the 80s when they had the 12% mortgage. I, I wouldn't even say that it's the debt mountain as much as it is the potential energy in the economy relative to the kinetic energy in the economy. Let me just explain what that means. Yeah, explain that. Um, kinetic energy, I would argue, is a function of, you know, you are currently in motion, right? Mm -hmm. And when something is in motion, it requires something to intervene to stop it, right? Newton, a body in yep. motion remains in motion until an external force acts upon it. In the case of an economy that tends to be, you know, we refer to that as what's the catalyst? What is going to cause it to slow down, right? Uh, there's a variety of things that can cause that, one of which is obviously a credit event, which cuts off spending, right? It means that people can no longer actually obtain resources that allow them to continue to spend over and above their economic uh, immediate outcome or immediate potential. It also can be a function of increased debt service associated with the credit that they've already taken on, right? That's what an increase in interest rates is. When I refinance my existing debts, 
looking forward, the servicing of those debts at higher interest rates is going to consume a larger fraction of my income, making it harder for me to continue to spend, setting up the conditions that cause things to slow. I think that's what we're facing right now. We're looking at a situation in which everything is fine until people need to refinance the debts or confront the reality that they need to take on additional debt in order to maintain spending. Um, I didn't write about it on my sub stack. I did write about it on Twitter. There's actually been this rise in what's called doom spending, right? Which is basically mm -hmm. millennials and um, to a lesser extent, Gen Zs who are saying, I can't afford to buy a house. I'll never be able to afford to buy a house. Therefore, I should buy a really nice watch, right? Or therefore, I should buy a sports car or therefore, I should go with my friends and have brunch in the city and pay more than I thought I was going to because gosh, we just only live once, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that type of dynamic continues. The, the fatalist because, YOLO. <laughs> the fatalist YOLO, that's exactly what it is. And I think there's a big chunk of us seeing that. And by the way, if we go back and we look at prior periods where we've seen those types of activities, you know, the 1920s obviously jumps out as a good example of that type of fatalist YOLO, having watched their peers chopped up on the fields of France and Germany, or watching them die associated with the Spanish flu put in place for a lot of people, well, what's really the point, right? right? And all sorts of cultural phenomenons emerged around that, similar to the dynamics that we're seeing today. Um, that doesn't mean, by the way, I just want to be very clear, that doesn't mean the Great Depression comes next, but it does raise the risks of that occurring, right? So if I go back and I look at 1979 and I describe the status of the U.S. economy for you, we were dealing with very high inflation, but that inflation was being driven primarily by a large outward shift in the aggregate demand curve. That was a function of the baby boomers being young and doing what young people typically do, which is buy capital assets that get them started in life. That's renting an apartment in a city that has a job available to them. It means buying a suit. It means buying a dishwasher. It means buying a car so you can get to that job, et cetera. That outward shift in the aggregate demand curve is really what powered most of the inflation of the 1970s. And as that peaked and began to come down, as labor force growth and household formation growth slowed in the 1980s, it became easier for us to catch up on the supply side to the demand equation and normalize and bring down inflation to levels that were the, that we're currently used to or that we were used to until the pandemic. What happened this time around is something very, very different. We're actually looking at possibly the lowest potential growth in U.S. economic history. Population growth has slowed to a crawl. Almost all household formation at this point is the elderly, those who are no longer economically active. And so the supply of labor has actually been quite restricted. The labor force growth levels are a tiny fraction of what they were in 1979. They were three plus percent in 1979. Today, they're running about 10 basis points. By the way, for, for many segments of the economy, like those with less than a high school, less than a college graduate, gradu graduate degree, we're actually seeing contraction in the labor force, which helps to explain the tightness that we've experienced in those segments of the labor force. So we're looking at something that's it's almost 180 degrees in the opposite direction of where we were in 1979, where under the deregulation framework and the cutting taxes framework, we were able to liberate an incredible amount of growth in the U.S. economy with very little increase in labor content. Right? That's why the 1980s and 1990s looked so fantastic. Um, so now, of course, we're, we're, we're kind of trapped in the situation. And as bad as it is here in the United States, like, Put yourself in China's shoes. 1972, Nixon travels over to China, and basically everybody in China is wandering around saying, well, what do we do You know, now that we've finished killing off our elders under the Cultural Revolution, right? They didn't have any steel. They didn't have any manufacturing operations. They didn't have anything other than a ton of people that were underutilized. And now China has gone to the other extreme where their labor force is actually shrinking at a more rapid rate than almost any we've seen in history. Mm -hmm. Right. Initially, that shows up as a demographic dividend. Great. There's no kids. I don't have to spend any money on them. I can spend money on productive things because kids are not particularly productive, followed by, oh, my gosh, who's going to take care of me in my old age? And that's, you know, unfortunately, that's kind of the status of the world today. Who's going to take care of us in our old age? And the, the deterioration of the deficit, as we were mentioning, has two components to it. One was the unexpected rise in interest rates. 
And the second one is the entirely predictable aspect that in the United States, we have a pay-as-you-go retirement system in the form of Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. And those are exploding as those same baby boomers leave the system mm -hmm. and begin drawing those down. And there's no way around that other than to abrogate our responsibility to them, which candidly, I would argue they should be volunteering for. This is one of the real frustrations that we have. Those that have been most successful in our society have become so disenfranchised and so focused on the idea that they created what they have and that they are the ones that are rightfully entitled to their success, not those who are members of the society with them that have been less fortunate or candidly less skilled or less thoughtful in the application of the resources that were made available to them you know, we're turning around and saying, well, I'm not going to help them, right? The answer is, unfortunately, we have to at some point. And so if the elites, those who have done so well, are not willing to make those choices, the reason you're seeing the rise of the Trumps and the rise of populism, et cetera, is because the will of the people is ultimately going to force them to take it and then some. Wow. So um, I generally kind of tread into this territory usually later on in these discussions yeah. <laughs> because it, 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 it's hard not to see most of the roads that we're on eventually ending up in this area if unless there's just major reform, which I don't see anywhere. I, 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 I hope for, and I think that we're still early enough in this process that there's a chance for it. But the longer we put it off, the longer we wait until those who have the resources stand up and say, hey, look, here's what we can do to fix it. And here's how I'm going to do more than my fair share to start the process of fixing it. The, the closer you get to that end point, the higher the risk that you put in place an authoritarian who forces those changes through and right. takes a pretty, pretty penny for themselves in the process. Right, and or you 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 run the risk of of really big breakages that um, that redistribute uh, wealth either by just destruction, right? You have sort of a systemic breakdown that just wipes out a lot of asset value, or you have an uprising where it's just taken in a really messy way. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I I'd want to actually address that though because I think it's really yeah. important that people understand this. Right, when systems break, understand. It's not the billionaire who suffers, right? Um, everything should be measured as distance from sub, you know, subsistence or survival. And those, what we're seeing in our society with rising homelessness, with rising um, deaths of despair, et cetera, are more and more people who are basically close to that quitting point, right? right. They're right on the edge. And, you know, are their lives meaningfully better than the lives of, you know, um, chimpanzees living in, um, the, you know, great apes living in, you know, our primate ancestors living in, in subsistence conditions, they're really not. I mean, look at the homelessness in major cities and look at the levels of drug addiction. I mean, these people are far more desperate and far sadder as individuals than we ever would have been historically. Like, it's just an incredible display of, of helplessness. All right, so I've got a ton of questions related to macro and the economy that we're still yeah. going to get to, but I want to dig into here first because this yeah. really is, I think, the heart of of you know our, our destiny as a society. Yep. Um, so, Mike, let, let, let me ask you this: um, uh, the question I'll often ask people is like, all right, so I make you world emperor, right? You know, uh, what what reforms would you put in place? Hopefully, you were a benevolent one, right? Um, and so I guess I want to ask you that question, but but let me ask you sort of a lead into that, which is, do you see the best of the reforms that that you would like to see undertaken happen from a from a top down standpoint, like the government mandating, OK, we're going to do X, Y or Z, or do you see it more um, on the private side, right, where, where, you know, there's a lot of stuff that government now is control of that basically sort of private charity used to run in previous generations, and some would say quite well. Um, so I guess my question is, do you favor more of a state-driven solution or a, of a private-driven solution? Well, let, let me just ask you very quickly. When you say that charities have, have historically done it quite well, could you give me an example of what you're referring to? Yeah, a lot of hospitals, you know, certainly originally back in the you know, turn of the century, you know, you had a, you had a lot of hospitals that were, were funded by private individuals. Um, 
people will oftentimes contrast that to government policies we have right now in healthcare that have, some would say, really ballooned up costs and, and brought care down and are demoralizing our doctors and our nurses and whatnot. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I do think that there's an element of what both of us are saying there, right? So when I think about the institutions or the dynamics of charity, you know, we've moved from charitable contributions to found hospitals or to create sanatoriums because health tended to be the great equalizer in historical periods, right? So the children of the wealthy were not particularly well protected from tuberculosis or communicable diseases relative to the children of the poor, right? You had a lower chance of getting typhus, mm -hmm. but you were still drinking from the same water supply. Um, you know, today you'll see situations, and this is kind of extreme, but, you know, I know of situations where people will only drink particular types of bottled water, mm -hmm. right? At the extreme level of it, right? That's been shipped in from various places around the world, right? So they can maximize their water intake. Stop, that's not that water, Adam. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you know, the, um, and, and there doesn't seem to be any sense of responsibility or what used to be referred to as the noblesse oblige to give back in that way. And I think part of it is because they're so insulated from those characteristics. Uh, I also think there's a big chunk of it, which is just that candidly, we've torn down a lot of the institutions that historically would have encouraged people to participate in the community in that way. So common attendance at church, something that the very wealthy used to do as a matter of course at the end of the 19th century during the Gilded Age, was an opportunity for people to be part of the broader community that they participated in. Today, people are more likely to lay in their, you know, wonderful horsehair bed, um, you know, that's been cooled by a, uh, you know, sleep pod to the, exactly the right temperature to maximize their sleep. And they pull out their smartphone and they tweet something snide, you know, in terms of an observation about how terrible the world is, right? Um, that's a very different way to spend your Sunday than putting on your Sunday best and going to join in communion with your compatriots in, in your society. So I just think people are are much more separated, and I think the elites are much more separated, much more tend to they just give much more, at least until very recently, to the organizations that characterize them as his elite, right? Where do mm -hmm. they give money? Well, let's give it to Harvard, let's give it to Penn, let's give it to Stanford, right? You know, why? What a stupid way to give money away. So yeah, so so back to my question then, which is yeah, um, I, I, so, so to answer your question directly, yeah. I think part of the problem is is that again. I don't necessarily see the elites making those choices that they would have historically. And I think part of that could be that the government is trying to take on those additional responsibilities. But please find me examples of brand new hospitals being created or brand new social infrastructure that is being created to any significant degree, because it's just not really happening. Right. We're basically operating on this pay go type model where everything is focused on. Well, all right, let me just give you a check to, to tide you over to today. Right. Right. Oh, I, no, I totally agree with that. So again, um, and we're about to make you Emperor Mike, but um, do you think that the, the reforms that we need, are they going to need to come from the state or are they going to need to come more from the citizenry saying, hey, look, I've, I've had a great ride up until now, but if, 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 if I don't start contributing back, if I don't start getting more involved, if I don't start laying the infrastructure we're going to need, to kind of bring everybody up more, uh, the pitchforks might come out and, and my elitism might actually put a big target on me. Um, the quick answer is, is I, I, I don't think that there are a lot of examples in history where the pitchforks have come out and targeted the elites without a segment of the elites turning on the other elites, right? Um, mm -hmm. Peter Turchin, I encourage people to actually read his work uh, uh, it's in an area it's called cleodynamics, but his underlying hypothesis is effectively that when there is a surplus of the elites, you begin to, you know, too many college grads, right? Too many people have bought into the narrative that if they pay $85,000 a year to go to Harvard or $35,000 a year to go to Harvard Extension School, that that somehow makes them a member who is guaranteed success in society, not unlike joining the Masonic Lodge in the 18th or 19th century would convey that you were part of an elite that received preferential treatment, right? That's really what they've become. That's what universities have become. Um, so, it, you know, it, there's just not a lot of examples 
in history of the elite stepping forward and saying, okay, what can we do to make this better? It does require the sort of catastrophe or social event like a 1930s that empowered Franklin Del Delano Roosevelt to become a traitor to his class and effectively say, we're going to make people pay far more for their participation in this society and the opportunity to make this sort of income. And by the way, I just want to convey, I, I don't think it's right to set 94% tax rates, right? I just want to be really clear. That was a vindictive okay. action by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that when people show you the highest marginal tax rates over history, I just want to remind people, six people in the entire United States paid that tax rate. Henry Ford was the target. Thomas Watson was another one. So, you know, it's not like that was actually a sign that like everybody had to give up 94%. But there are periods where it makes sense to say, no, we all need to pull together and taxes are part of that. And there are periods in which it's like, hey, wait a second, as 1979 showed, we've got incredible potential growth ahead of us. We've allowed the government to become too intrusive. We've allowed regulations to become too severe. And as a result, we can actually make progress in the opposite direction. I just think the, these things go in cycles, right? They're like yeah. sinusoidal waves. We're almost certainly at a point in which there will be higher taxes. There will be more government involvement. There will be additional regulation coming our way. And I know that's a very frustrating message, but the more we can actually embrace that and our leadership can actually take a leading role in conveying why this is important and why it's powerful. And it has to come from people that people identify with have a really hard time believing that they're identifying with a geriatric in either party. So um, someone who would agree with you would be um, Neil Howe, uh, yep. demographer, creator of the fourth turning. Fourth turnings are characterized by um, a rise in centralized control. Um, in fact, it's not just the government stepping up to, to do it because there are problems that need solving. It's actually the citizenry demanding that the government uh, get involved more to solve these problems. So it is what we tend to see in the in these cycles here. Um, you know, I asked Neil, and you probably find this interesting, I asked him, like, when I look back on on previous eras, where we had real challenges uh, in, in this country, you know, we can we can point to to leaders and say, Oh, these people were really critical and, and, you know, creating a platform and rallying support around it and driving real reform. And I said, I'm looking around here, like I'm not, I'm not seeing many right now. Do we just have like a, a a bum crop this time around or whatever? And he said, No, we'll have them. It, you just need to have. It, they they don't volunteer for the role. They get thrust into it, and the pressures just have to get great enough for that new leader to get catapulted higher. And he said, We just haven't had the pressures get get that great enough yet. But let's say the pressures get that great, and one of the leaders that emerges is is Emperor Mike. Um, what? Which one? Are, and I know this. This isn't probably the conversation you, you thought you were going to have when you you hopped on with me today. But um, which one? No, are this, you this I actually planned on coming here as the kickoff to my campaign to become Emperor Mike. But okay. Yeah. Well, you, you got my vote. Even though as Emperor, right. maybe you, you don't need it. You can just take it. But um, but which one or two reforms that you would you would like start with right away? Um. So, I mean, the, the, the quick one is, is that I would I would raise taxes in a significantly progressive way. Um, I would undo the Trump tax cuts. I would reverse much of the tax cuts that have been done since 1986. Um, you know, the simple reality is, is that we have a problem of tax collection, not necessarily of expenditure. It's not so much that the spending as a percent, the federal spending as a percentage of GDP particularly that that's spent on infrastructure, on education, on science and technology, on military. It's not that those have expanded so much. It's actually that we're spending a lot more in the form of social support and we're collecting a lot less in terms of taxes from those who have benefited the most from our society. Um, the second thing, and, and unfortunately, I'd probably flip them in reverse, which is to say the second component is, is that I would uh, try to encourage people to think about treating the U.S. budget as a capital account. What are we investing in? And there's almost no scenario in which you can argue that investments in the old have any value except to convey that we care and that you are going to be, remain a member of our society past the point that you are entirely productive, right? Um, but right now, what we have is we basically have people voting Let's not spend money on kids. Let's not provide adequate nutrition. 
let's actually take it out on people who can't afford to take care of themselves, you know, and basically make conditions for them so unattractive that they're willing to work for me for basically pennies on the dollar. Um, that's just a terrible policy. And, and, and that I would argue is where we need to reorient. So I would refocus the budget. I actually did this. I'd refocus the budget around education and spending. I would encourage the creation of private uh, public partnerships, things like charter schools, for example. And I would go a step further and then actually encourage, create the conditions under which we can take successful models of charter schools and we can rapidly expand them. Right? We just don't have that today. Like, as I think you were aware, I, I'm uh, a regular donor to a, a charter school in Coney Island, New York, called Coney Island Prep. It has unbelievable success with amongst the most challenged populations, immigrants, um, and those of reduced economic circumstances in Brighton Beach, New York, right? They're producing kids that are going from kindergarten through through high school and attending college with something like a 97% success rate, right? Why that's not being replicated, I can't figure it out. I just don't understand it. I mean, I do mechanically because we have a society that is set up to do things like protect the jobs of teachers over encourage the outcomes of students. But man, the, it's, it's there. We just refuse to act on it. I, I use this line all the time. We have, we lack the courage to change. And the last policy that I would do is I would go bananas. And I mean, bananas on building out nuclear capacity. Okay. Um, I, you and I have talked, I think, offline, and and I do have a note here, if there's time, to to pull some of um, uh, the things that you're really optimistic about yep. um, from an economic standpoint. And I remember the last time we talked, after we turned the camera off, we talked for a bit about some energy um, yep. uh, technologies and innovations that you were excited about. Uh, nuclear, I think, you know, we've talked about enough on this channel that that I, I think it's you know there's a growing awareness that that is. I think it's going to have to happen at some point, right? You talk about we lack the courage to change. Um, I, uh, I I totally agree with you. That's just a human, that's part of human nature, I think, in general. We, we, we generally don't act until the pain of continuing the status quo becomes greater than the pain of change. Um, I, I really wish that we would not wait until that point about most things in life, that we would proactively, you know, like you, think about what the consequences are going to be in the future and change today to avoid them. Um, but, uh, but hopefully on all the things you mentioned, um, you know, maybe, maybe saner, smarter thinking prevails before we get to that, that, that pain point, right. That, 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 that must change pain point, but who knows who probably won't. I, 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 I'm, I am actually more hopeful than you are on that. I mean, uh, to me, the changes and I'll, I'll, I'll pull up a chart. I know that, um, now this is done on YouTube, so we can, we can, um, highlight it. I'll pull up the chart. I'm looking for it right now. It actually highlights one of the key challenges, which is it's very hard to explain to people the counterfactuals. Mm -hmm. right? It's really, really hard to explain to people how much better their life could have been if X choice would have been made because they just can't do it. Right. Um, and so, like, I, I think that's part of the education process that needs to occur is actually convincing people that there is a better future ahead for us if we choose to make those choices. Yeah, and what I don't understand on that, and I know you're looking for the chart, is yeah. um, we're a big company, a country, I mean. We got a lot of land, we got a ton of people. Like, why couldn't we be doing more of pilot programs like you talk about your charter school there, right? Like, why can't we just say, look, let's, let's pilot a couple of different educational models and then let's see how they perform. And then let's pick, let, let's adopt what the best ones, you know, the best results uh, are revealing to us, right? Why don't we do that with nuclear? Why don't we put some SMRs in you know, one county and just say, hey, that wants them and say, hey, let's see how it goes. And if it goes great, fantastic. Let's roll those out and deploy them nationally, right? Like we have the ability to do all this and that would go a long way to convincing people, but we don't seem to be that planful about it. Um, I think part of it again is that, that fear, right? Um, if you're gonna build nuclear, for example, you actually need to acknowledge that people will have you'll, you'll have to engage in eminent domain right um and nobody wants to do that um like it, it, as painful as that sounds and i know people hear this they're like eminent domain you might you've got to be crazy right um but you you need to actually do that 
So um, look, th this is U.S. energy consumption per capita, right? And you may have seen me show this chart, but I just want to I, I just want to nail this home for people. So you know what happened here was the abandonment of the U.S. nuclear programs, and the implementation of the Clean Air Act. And we basically told people that what we were doing was unsustainable, that we were destroying the world, and we needed to do less. We needed to have less. We needed to put on our sweaters, as Jimmy Carter might point out, and turn down the temperature, right? The decision to do that meant that we took potential capability away from people. It meant that jobs that could have been here in the United States had to be outsourced to China or to Mexico, or to Europe, or Japan at that time was, was much more likely. Um, that difference, that gap between energy consumption per capita in terms of power output per person, and where we are today, right, what could have ultimately happened is the equivalent of every single person in our, in our country getting to go to the moon and back twice on a vacation trip. Right now, that sounds like a terrible vacation, but it just gives you some idea of the quantity of capability that we're talking about. And we know that people actually want this because the other uses of it, things like flying private jets all the time, is what the really wealthy in our society does. So we know that the, de the demand is there and it's an unmet demand and it manifests itself in frustration. Um, it's a fantastic chart um, that really makes the point in a way I haven't seen made before. So um, I, I've done other um, interviews in 2023 about the promise and the benefits of, of nuclear energy. So we're we're, we're not going to hash all that out here because, yep. folks, if if you're if you're questioning it, if if you if you've just heard for most of your life that you know nuclear energy is bad and it comes with with all these risks, um, uh, it, it's a much more nuanced story than that. And actually a lot of kind of the prevailing uh, wisdom about it, or at least what we've been told over the past 50 years, you know, since since that point of departure on your chart there, Michael, uh, a lot of it's not really based in a lot of proven fact and evidence at this point. And, and the opportunity is so tremendous, as Mike's been saying here. So so anyways, folks, go go listen to some of my past uh, interviews on that if you've if you've got some questions. Um, but um, uh, I guess let me ask you this, Mike, and then we'll get back to the economic side of things. Yep. On on the nuclear side, if we if we did invest in um, the capacity that you think we should be creating for the society, um, what what are some of the biggest manifestations that you would see you would expect to see coming from that in terms of benefits? Well, I mean, obviously we get to travel to the moon and back twice, but the, <laughs> who doesn't want to uh, do that? No, I mean everything that we're talking about when you when you talk about making the right choices, right? So thoughtful choices about how to spend your resources, it manifests itself in less work, more leisure, better outcomes. That sounds like a, a trifecta win for me, right? We get more output, we get less work, and we get more leisure. I, I don't know how anyone complains about that. Right? And it sounds really ridiculous to actually focus on that, but th these are the things that we're talking about. If we improve the education of our children, if we improve the productivity of education, like just stop and think about this. Most of your audience will be parents or grandparents, right? By definition, those are the people that have money. Um, how hard is it to get your child to pay attention to a smartphone? I, I, it's harder to get them away from the I was smartphone. I'm going to say, yeah, it, it's anti-hard. Right? <laughs> And yet those same tools that we use to create this addictive piece of hardware equipment that conveys unbelievable information is totally absent and not those techniques are not used at all in education, right? And these are all the little simple things. Like when you're scrolling through Facebook, they know when you pause on something, they know when you stop and consider something, they know how much time you spend looking at a certain segment of the screen. Ask a teacher how much time each student spent looking at the calculus textbook. They have no idea. They have absolutely no idea. We're not providing teachers with the modern tools that actually would allow them to demand and create better outcomes for their students. On the flip side of that, we're doing the most ridiculous things. We're leaving unmonitored cell phones in the hands of teenagers when they go off to high school. We know that this destroys outcomes. We know these are bad choices. Why would you ever do something like that? I mean, just give the kids heroin for heck's sake. 
Um, yeah, I just uh, I hear you talk here. I'm, I'm reminded of um, Charlie Munger's, you know, show me the incentive. I'll show you the right. outcome. We just Proof seem to have system, all these. That's what it does. Yeah, right. we have we we have we have in many cases more mal incentives than we have positive incentives, and therefore we're not getting the outcomes we want to get. But we we know that we've always known that. That's why we have things like sin taxes, right? Why do we tax things that are bad for us? It's not because we want people to do less of them per se, although we know that that's actually a positive outcome, right? But we also know that they really have a hard time not doing them. And so by taxing them, we're actually generating revenues associated with that and theoretically redirecting. The objective of putting taxes on gambling or special taxes on marijuana or special taxes on alcohol is not about paying pensions for public employees, right? That's not a great outcome. It is about funding schools. It is about funding innovation. It is about making our infrastructure better and more robust. And we're just not using it for that because we don't actually have the systems in place that allow either transparency or even really thoughtful analysis around these things. All right. And thoughtful analysis like that's I, so I really appreciate you having this discussion with me, Mike, here. Um, you know, we're at the point where we have, um, you know, some some very big looming problems in, in this wealth inequality that just continues to get wider and wider um, is, is a huge one and clearly near and dear to your heart as is to mine, Mike. And, and, and it's at the point where there's a lot of things we could be doing better to help that we're not right. And we need to, we, we need to find the will to start doing things right and putting positive incentives in place and positive systems in place. But we're also likely so far ahead of, of this problem that we're not going to, we're not going to magically solve it without some pain at this point in time. And Emperor Mike, you know, a lot of the things you proposed, not so much the nuclear stuff, but, but some of the other stuff be really painful to, to those that, that, currently have a lot of uh, prosperity in their lives. And we can have a huge conversation about, you know, the, the justice or injustice of that. But um, my point is, is there's no easy solutions out here. And obviously ignoring it, not talking about it um, is, you know, the whole like uh, not having a plan is to plan to fail, right? Mm -hmm. um, we just need to start having these adult sized conversations about this. And I'm sure some folks have heard some proposals from you on this that they don't like, and that's okay. Um, we just need to start having a conversation of, Hey, anybody have a better idea? Cause if not, you know, there's a destiny down here that that's not going to be good for anybody. If we let the current trajectory keep on going. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And I think we all know this, right? I mean, there's always the, the definition of a choice means foregoing an alternate, right? Right. We all would love to have available to us every possible choice with no possible restrictions. We hear this all the time, you know, from people who are effectively, um, you know, anarchists in their underlying construction. We'll hear things from the crypto community. I'm going to piss any number of viewers off, but, you know, things like, well, there should be no rules against money laundering. What a terrible idea, right? Um, you know, how, who are you to say what is a criminal activity or not? Well, guess what? You participate in a society, right? Society actually defines criminality. That's what a law actually is. And the fact that you don't want to follow those laws is not your prerogative. We have a solution for that. It's called jail, right? That unfortunately is, is, is part of the responsibility that we each have. We may not actually agree with all the decisions. I know I personally would be horribly upset and angry if the government came along and said, guess what? We've looked at all the places that we could possibly build nuclear in this area, and your house is the perfect siting for it, right? I don't want to sell my house, but somebody is going to have to. And at some point, we need to recognize that things that are in the constitutions, like the takings clause, doesn't prevent the government from acquiring your property. It prevents the government from taking your property without compensating you. Right? There's a big difference between those two. Let's argue about the compensation. Let's stop arguing about should the government be allowed to do that or not. Right? We have to make these choices. All right. Well, look, Mike, um, I, I hope you will continue to come on this program and help advance the ball on this discussion, which I hope to be having with more and more people, too, as we, we, we go forward from here. Because, again, uh, the stakes are just too high for us to not try to figure out a better way 
uh, to, to step into the future than the current trajectory that it seems to be we're on on, on many fronts. But that being said, let me let me pull the conversation. Please, back yeah, exactly. You. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's been great. Um, OK, I've got one big risk and then I want to sort of end with your market outlook. And, and yeah. you know, as a capital manager, you're having to figure out how to how to navigate yeah. this world. So I'm curious what you're looking at for 2024. Um, so um, I. I I'll short circuit this by saying I just watched an interview that you gave with Ted Oakley. Yes. And Ted asked you, hey, Mike, you know, so what's up with the recession? And you basically said, hey, you know, like there were a lot of factors uh, that intervened last year to kind of kind of maybe suppress the, the the visible impacts of a recession. We might have kind of had recessions going on in certain parts of the economy, but we didn't get that big rollover we all thought about. And if I heard you correctly, I think you said your attention right now is maybe a a little more focused on the credit side of things and the fact that we may have a credit or we, we could have a credit event coming up. It sounded like you were pretty focused on what's happening with the maturity wall that's coming yep. up corporate America. Uh, yep. and, and, and based on your comments, I also am going to extrapolate to just U.S. households as well, which have been taking on debt at a much higher rate recently where they may be beginning to hit uh, you know, their debt saturation limits at some point too. So um, how concerned are you on the credit side of things? So I, I'm pretty concerned. And um, I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll show a couple of slides here just very quickly since we do have the benefit of um, uh, multimedia here. So first, this is the maturity wall that we're facing in high yield. Um, those who went through the housing market crisis may remember that there was a similar discussion around the maturity wall, around teaser rates and all sorts of stuff that effectively create conditions under when you need to refinance. Um, we've currently gotten to the shortest uh, time to maturity in the history of the high yield space. The average tenor of a high yield bond is now under five years in the index. Uh, if I go back to 2007, that was eight years, for example. So that maturity wall that used to be much flatter has now become much steeper and much bigger. The second component is, is the level of change that we will encounter when companies refinance. Um, when, if I look at the current coupon across most levered companies, it's about four and a half to five and a half percent is the coupon rate that they are paying on their debt. When interest rates rise, that debt falls in the secondary market, what's called the yield to maturity or the yield to worst rises to reflect the current level of interest rates but it has no impact on the actual cash outlay of the company until they refinance. So now we're actually rapidly approaching this point and the spread between the levels of the coupons that they're currently paying the cash outlays and what they will likely have to pay is probably the widest it's ever been in history. And that's before we start considering the underlying dynamics of what happens if a credit event exists and forces a repricing of credit to much wider spreads so you have this underlying characteristic, these debts have to be refinanced at much higher rates um, or paid off and simply these companies can't pay them off. And that then leads us to the second part of it, which is the credit spread dynamic. Um, this is my credit model um, in black. You can actually see my estimate of credit spreads in red. You can see the absolute level of those. And interestingly enough, in blue, the light blue line, this is actually realized bankruptcy is the reason why I'm showing that is you can see how that the contours of that pretty closely follow my black line, even though that black line has does not include bankruptcies as an input, right? So my black line, theoretically, my, my estimate of where credit should be is independent of the level of bankruptcies, but is being confirmed by the level of bankruptcies. If All right, and sorry, just, just for folks watching this and for those that are listening to a podcast and can't see this, um, your, your, your red line and your black line here, your red line is where credit spreads are right now. Correct. Your black line is where your model says they should be. And Correct. if I've got that right, then here in these last couple of years, massive divergence between the two. Massive divergence, larger than any divergence we've seen, including the precursor to the global financial crisis. So if your model is right, this means that credit spreads really need to, to start blowing out. Yeah, I mean, my models would suggest credit spread should be closer to 800 basis points as compared to the current levels that are in the low low to mid fours. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have any more charts to show. If you do, pull them up. But if not, I want to ask you this question. We talked about employment as being sort of the recession bulwark yep. earlier. If this maturity wall 
starts hitting in earnest as your data says it should, could that be what breaks the employment bulwark where companies have to start jettisoning staff to, you know, retain cost to, to, to be able cost. to pay to pay the rent right to, yeah. to pay the interest on their bonds um i definitely think that's a, a a critical component of it and if i look at the levels of employment while ai may sound exciting and sexy there's a tiny fraction of the u.s population that has any direct uh employment in those areas of growth meanwhile the levered companies those that we're highlighting here represent about 30 percent of u.s employment in total and so we're actually looking at a potentially quite significant event from the employment standpoint. Now, where this, of course, becomes really perverse is if you think about the underlying dynamics of tight credit spreads, what's perceived as loose financial conditions, markets at all all time highs, unemployment low, if you're an employer, you're gonna do everything you possibly can to avoid making these hard choices, not just on refinancing your credit, but also in terms of retaining your employees, right? In a tight employment market, the last thing you want to do is be the person who fires people because it then becomes very hard for people to go back to work for you, right? They find other jobs, they become um, permanently employed elsewhere, and you suddenly are trapped in a very difficult situation if your forecast happened to be off. And so you'll hoard labor as much as you possibly can until the last possible second. And we're seeing a lot of evidence of this, right? Falling hours rather than unemployment rising is a perfect indicator of exactly this type of dynamic. I can't possibly know that this is going to happen. But what I'm suggesting is, is that the cycle seems to be setting up so that it's a much higher probability than it is under normal consideration. And when you say it's a much higher probability, are you talking about the, the switch from hoarding to jettisoning? Yeah. So, I mean, look, if, if the government were to come out and say, we will pay all employers to keep people employed, then we won't see the rise in unemployment, right? right. I mean, that's, oh. pretty, that's pretty straightforward. Right. And sorry, just to interject, because that's really relevant. We've just seen the ending of the ERP, <laughs> exactly. the employment retention program. So the government's basically saying, I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, and, and not only are you seeing that, you're also seeing the levels. So the signals that we use to send us this information, things like unemployment rates, initial jobless claims, et cetera, the level of jobless benefits has fallen so long, so far relative to incomes, particularly in the aftermath of the increase in wages that we saw around the pandemic, that we're actually seeing very strong evidence that people are just saying, well, you know, what's the point? Why would I bother to file for unemployment claims, right? State of California, you max out your employment benefits at around $11,000 a year. That's something like 75% below the poverty line in California. Mm -hmm. Is $11,000 something, and by the way, that's taxable. Congratulations. Um, it, you know, should I flip around and chase after that $11,000 and have to show up and demonstrate that I'm continually looking for new work? Or should I start driving a car for Uber, drawing down the depreciation on an asset I already own and probably owe money on and make a little bit more money, but at the same time, understand that I'm in an industry that is even more susceptible to an economic downturn and worse outcomes and that hitting all at once at the same time, right? It's that fragility that I'm seeing us build where the information systems that we would have historically relied on, things like rises and jobless claims, aren't happening because they're just meaningless. Right. And I've been making this analogy of, of you know, central planners basically being pilots in a plane where the instrumentation is increasingly off, right? 100%. 100%. And by the way, like you heard Jerome Powell extol the virtues of the quality of data coming from the labor segment of the economy on 60 Minutes last night. I mean, right. I was literally sitting there like, well, I can't believe you just said that because we know that the quality of the data we're getting out of the labor, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is the worst we've ever seen. We actually, like, that's not me making a statement. We know response rates have plummeted, right? We actually know that the information that we're receiving is increasingly massaged by things like the birth death model, right. which presumes the number of jobs that are being created and by the way, in last week's revisions, which people will point to as contributing to the labor beat, the only data that was actually revised by real data, not by seasonal adjustments, was Q1 of 2023, for which we reduced employment estimates by 370,000. 
right? So all those positive revisions that show, oh, December was actually better than we thought, and January was downright magnificent, all that data is like basically massaged, and the actual real data said, yeah, the start of Q1, the start of 2023 was much worse than we thought it was, all right. even after all the negative revisions. I, I got to start wrapping up. There's so many questions that I, we didn't get to that that we're just going well, to. Well, let, let me on. let me let me steal from you for a second and, and give yeah. you one that I think is actually the really important one. And Great. so I'm just going to share one more slide for you because this is really why I think a lot of this matters in a in a pretty meaningful way. Um, you know, people that have listened to me in the past have heard me talk about the bid for passive and the structural dynamics of money flowing into 401ks, and I just want to emphasize and highlight for people that we're actually now starting to see what I was worried about, which is the signs that the market is hitting a point at which the flows into these strategies are beginning to slow and turn negative. And I'm going to use two different slides here to show this, just so people are aware. 401ks, which are the savings vehicle, those almost exclusively flow through mutual funds. We're actually seeing signs that those are beginning to turn negative in the mutual fund side. All right, and why? To, um, simply because the aging of the baby boomers, they're moving out of the retirement system. They're beginning to draw down the system. It's just a numbers game. And the other last thing I would just highlight on that is remember that withdrawals are always a function of wealth in a 401k. It's how much is the is it worth? Contributions are always a function of income. So mm -hmm. when assets rise faster than incomes, withdrawals will cross over this point faster than they otherwise would. Right, so that's part of what's ultimately playing out here. Um, so this is a demographic feature. This is the same deterioration that you're seeing in the US financial budget, fiscal budget, if you exclude the interest rate increase. And that mutual fund downturn has been offset up until this point by ETF growth, which is money that's reinvested. Um, you know, it's, it's unusual to see those in things like 401ks. If I combine those two on a dollar for dollar basis, like we're actually seeing that slow and turn negative for really the first time since the start of the pandemic. And whether this and this appears to be much more structural in its feature. This is what I'm scared about. This is what I'm worried about is when those passive vehicles that operate off of those super simple models, if you give me cash, then buy. If you ask for cash, then sell. We're starting to see the signs that they're being asked for cash. All right, this is huge. So you have talked about this, I referred to it, I believe in the past as the giant mindless robot, right? Yep. And this has been, you think a, a large, perhaps massive contributor to how financial asset prices, stocks most importantly, have just been grinding higher, particularly a certain part of the stock market, right? The mag seven, right? Yep. The stocks that get an unfair share of every new dollar contributed to the market. And as long as those passive inflows, uh, those capital inflows continue to be net positive, then the math basically says, well, then stocks have to go up, right? And yes. your fear has been, if those capital inflows begin to turn negative, you have that same phenomenon just in reverse. And if the, this begins to happen for a structural reason, then we basically are in danger of a big unwind of a lot of the stock market prosperity that we've seen, say, over the past decade. True? Unfortunately, that's a correct interpretation of my fears. Okay. Okay. So, um, man, I feel like we're we're ending like right on the real meat of the entree here. Um, I guess I got to ask, so I got two questions for you. Um, one is, um, how worried are you about this? Is this a, ah, I'm a little bit worried or is this like, hey, it's, we're getting close to DEF CON 1. Let's start with that one. Um. Well, the, the quick answer is, is that the quality of data and the timeliness of data that we get prevents me from ever going to DEF CON 1. I just want to be really yeah. clear on that. Um, the second is, is that authorities can play all sorts of games, and they have done that. So I was actually quite concerned about this in the fourth quarter of 2018. If I were to pull that same chart back up, you would have seen a similar pattern of slowing, and you actually would have anticipated that you were going to see this number turn negative in 2019. Um, we changed the rules, right? We actually increased benefits associated with participating in 401ks and extended the duration date by, re by removing what's called the required minimum distribution from many accounts. We changed it from 70.5 years of age to 72. That bought us additional time. Um, it raises the magnitude of the problem now that we face, but it bought us time. And so like they, they can pull a rabbit out of the hat. 
Like there are things that can be done, right? The U.S. government could decide, okay, we're going to give $10,000 to each person to save in the stock market. I guarantee you that you're going to hear proposals like that floated over the next couple of years with the objective being to make everything better, right? The lobbying coming from Vanguard, BlackRock at all mm -hmm. is very much in that direction. Um, whether we see that or not, I, I can't possibly know, but we are running out of games that we can play. All right. And that's where I was going to go, um, which is, can they just do this forever? But it sounds like you think that that eventually the magic hat runs out of tricks. I, I think that's right, although it is a magic hat. So, like, I can't really tell you how magic hats happen, you know, function. I wish I had one, but I don't. So, um, and 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 look, I mean, I, I think there is no alternative for saving for retirement. I think there is no alternative for these things. But the perverse aspects are that if my theories are right, what is actually happening is, is that we've undersaved right? That we have taught ourselves to consume at a level of consumption without saving and without investment in, you know, the resources for actually making real assets, right? I, I see this all the time on Twitter and interactions where people are like, well, it's just so much more work for me to go get real assets. That's why I want financial assets, right? I don't want to own apartments. I want to own REITs, right? Because then right. I don't have to go collect rents. Well, guess what? If you're not actually doing the work, I think that the expression from Web 2.0, if you're not paying for it, right? You are the product. Well, guess what? That applies to 401ks too. If you're not putting your blood, sweat, and tears into figuring out what's going to happen with your retirement dollars, then guess what? You're actually the product. That's a great way to say it. Um, ma'am. All right. Well, look, uh, so you're a capital manager. Um, yep. you, you have to navigate and chart your client's capital uh, through all this. Uh, as you look out into 2024, we're still at the beginning of the year here. Um, what what kind of market are you expecting this year? And uh, and of course, it's, it's got the additional uncertainty of an election year. Um, and right now, what assets look favorable to you for this environment? And maybe which ones are you less likely to want to touch? Yeah, and I mean, going into the fourth quarter of last year, I was very much in favor that people should be buying bonds. Uh, once we crested five percent on the ten year, to me, that felt like an absolute no brainer. And in particular, I was actually highlighting for people things like 30-year tips that were offering two and a half you know, plus percent real yields for the next 30 years. Like That, to me, felt like one of the biggest no-brainers in history. Um, today, it's a little bit more challenging, right? Those 30-year tips in the aftermath of Powell's interview on um, 60 Minutes have moved back above 2%, so I actually think those are kind of interesting. Um I would argue that the delayed nature of the information that is flowing to Powell is contributing to this perception that they aren't going to be cutting anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate to hedge my portfolio against that by buying what's called puts on the SOFR futures. Um, those are now paying off and I'm taking them off and flipping that back again into longer dated interest rates which I think are actually reasonably attractive given the underlying dynamics of slow population growth, et cetera. Um, on the equity market side, it, you know, it's a very bifurcated outcome. If I'm correct about the direction that things are going to head, what's holding this, the mega caps up right now is not actually so much flows, although they are still more positive than they are in the other segments of the economy, as much as it is things like buybacks, et cetera, right? And general mm -hmm. sentiment around it. Um, but if those turn in any meaningful way, like we could, or if the flows become large enough to swamp those, and again, remember, these are big numbers we're talking about. Apple's buying back $80 billion worth of its stock this year. Um, but, you know, if those start to, to turn in any meaningful way, then you'll see kind of what you saw in 2022. 2022 was driven in my analysis by the Fed hiking interest rates not because it made it difficult for businesses to operate in higher interest rates, but because the, power, the Fed hiking interest rates from zero, very, very low interest rates to higher levels of interest rates is akin to a deus ex machina, you know, the god from the machine in a theater production coming down and solving the problem, right? I'm going to hike interest rates. That's going to cause things to happen, right? It's, you know, deus ex machina, something outside of the system that comes yep. in. Right. And so when they do that and you hike interest rates, it causes bonds to fall. And perversely, if you have a portfolio like a target date fund that has a fixed allocation between bonds and equities and bond prices fall, what do you have to do? You have to sell equities, buy bonds. 
sell, you know, bond prices go down because of hike in interest rates, sell equities, buy bonds. And we actually saw this pattern play out almost perfectly in 2022. This suggests that there was almost no fundamental information. It's what's called the portfolio rebalance channel coming through. That dynamic, I think, is actually the key risk that we face, where the portfolio rebalance now becomes one of the portfolio exit. And so you're going to get all sorts of weird information hmm. coming from markets, because just imagine the scenario, right? I head to retirement. I start to take my money out. What am I doing? Well, I'm actually further selling down equities and probably not buying that many bonds. And so you could end up with a situation which equities are going down and interest rates are going up because supply is increased while demand is not necessarily growing in the same manner. Now, I think ultimately that will break. I think that the opportunities to um, buy fixed income and secure a certain outcome for many of the institutional players that have things like asset liability matching, et cetera, I think that's just becoming a little too, you know, the, the, the clarity around that is becoming pretty overwhelming. I think that's part of what happened in the fourth quarter is what I call sticky allocations. You know, if I'm running an allocation mechanism that says I need to be in equities, and all of a sudden the, inform the, the information that is available says to me that the opportunity set to make money in fixed income, which is inherently lower risk, has risen so much more relative to equities that I have to start taking that and re taking my assets and reallocating them, that's not a decision that is made lightly, right? It requires constant reinforcement. It requires people sitting down in meetings. It requires all sorts of amazing discussions about how the future might be different from the past, right? And only once those have happened, can you start changing those allocations? I think we saw some of that in the fourth quarter. And now it becomes just a question of, you know, do we see that continue? But in the simplest terms, I think the future belongs to fixed income. I think we, are, we know that if we thoughtfully evaluate what we're seeing in financial markets, where I would argue that many of your listeners are probably doing things like covered call strategies or income generating strategies out of um, their equities because they know what they need is certainty. They need income. They need um, some dynamic that says, here's how much money you're going to make, not just how much you have. Right, because they're terrified, understandably, about outlasting their assets. They're trying to turn those into fixed income securities to pay yield to them. That tells me the demand for fixed income is off the charts. Right, when you take equities and you engage in a covered call strategy, all you've done is create a high yield bond with no covenants whatsoever. Right, that's what the payoff function of that is, and what's what's called put call parity, right, or risk neutral arbitrage. Um, so when you actually think about what you're, what people are doing, they're trying to create fixed income securities because there's a shortage of them. And so like, I just think the future belongs to fixed income. All right. Future belongs to fixed income. Hey, one thing you didn't mention that I thought you were going to say is, um, you know, betting on some increase in, in credit spreads. Well, so I, I absolutely do have that. So in, in the funds that I manage, I have um, the ability to buy CDS, credit default swaps. I also uh, create synthetic exposures to that through equity long short overlays. And so we have a couple of products at Simplify that have the capacity to do that. In particular, our high yield credit with a credit hedge um, is a way of capturing really attractive returns and at the same time protecting your portfolio against an increase in credit spreads. Last year was a very nice example of how that product works well, um, you know, outperforming the benchmark. And, you know, um, that was a very positive experience for us. So the, those types of strategies are absolutely there. But I, I really do strongly encourage people to like just stop and think, like, what are you actually doing with your portfolio when you buy a structured product or you buy a yield product? You're synthetically creating bonds. Right. And so the question is, are the bonds attractive enough that you should be buying them outright? And in some areas, I think the answer is yes. All right. Um, you know, I've I've had some requests uh, of late to to do a interview um, on um, income generating assets. Um, sounds I'm like not you're... the least bit surprised. Yeah. 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 And it sounds like you think that's probably only going to continue. The need for that's going to right. continue. Desire. Yeah. So, folks, if you are truly interested in that, uh, chime in the comment section below. If the demand's high enough, I'll bump that up on the priority list. Um, all right, Mike, thanks so much for going a little bit over with us here. Um, I'm just going to land the plane here. Um, two questions for you, two last questions. The first is very importantly, for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation and would like to follow you and your work, where should they go? Well, for that one person that's left that I haven't offended and, and is left <laughs> that has really enjoyed this conversation, 
Um, you can find me on Twitter at profplum99. You can find my sub stack at yesigiveafig.com. Um, it's also in my Twitter bio. And then for all of the products at Simplify and the type of work that we do, as well as all the information around those, please check out our website at www.simplify.us. All right, great. And Mike, when I edit this, um, I will put up the URLs to all those on the screen so folks know exactly where to go. Folks, I'll have links to those as well down in the description. So if you want a one-click access to them, you can get it. Um, all right, real quick, before I ask you the very last question, Mike, which is going to be, what is a non-money related investment you'd encourage folks to consider adopting? Um, just a couple of quick house, housekeeping rules. One, if you've enjoyed this conversation with Mike, would like him to come back on with us again in the future, particularly uh, to finish some of the conversations we didn't get a chance to get to, but also if his models start blinking, you know, very worrisomely on some of the issues we talked about, please let him know that by hitting the like button then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell, bell icon right next to it. Just want to remind folks that the uh, tickets for the one conference on Saturday, March 16th, uh, are available for sale. They're actually selling pretty briskly, which is wonderful to see. A lot of folks are taking me up on my recommendation to register now if you want to go so you can lock in our lowest early bird discount price before it expires. A reminder that if you're a premium subscriber to my Substack, which only costs $15 a month, you will save $50 uh, on top of that early bird discount price. So take advantage of that arbitrage, folks. Sign up just for a month if you need be to spend the 15 bucks to save the larger 50 bucks. I'm happy if you do that. I want you to get the lowest price. Um, FYI, Rick Rule just signed on to that conference. Um, so uh, another great name being added to all the other ones that are already there. Um, and then just a reminder, you know, uh, I think Mike's done a good job here of, you know, explaining why this is a, you know, it's a challenging environment for the average investor to navigate, um, especially if you're a regular person with a regular job and a family and all sorts of other things that are uh, demanding your attention. So as usual, highly recommend that you work with a good professional financial advisor who's in good standing with the regulatory authorities, but one that takes into account all the macro issues that Mike and I talked about here. And you know, when you add that last variable in the universe actually gets pretty darn small. Um, if you've got a good advisor who fits that, that uh, requirement set and uh, is doing a good job for you, great, stick with them. They are definitely worth it. Um, but if you don't, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, feel free to schedule a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses. These are the guys you see on the channel with me every week, the guys from New Harbor, Lance and the team from RIA, Jonathan Wellam from Canada. Uh, to schedule one of those free consultations, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com. They're totally free. There's no commitment to work with these guys, just a free public service that they offer. Okay, Mike, now we're back at you. What's one uh, non-money related investment you think would pay dividends for folks to consider? Well, you actually, um, you indirectly alluded to it. So um, I think I think some people are aware, but I, last year I became an empty nester and I actually sold, sold my house, uh, moved from California. My wife and I have been traveling around trying to figure out like what the next step in our lives looks like. And the, the, the most impactful thing that I've realized and this should not be a surprise to those of you who have listened to me in the past, is just how much I value being in proximity to my children and ultimately my grandchildren, and how much I've seen that impacts the happiness of those that I've gone to visit. So, you know, if you happen to live near your children or your grandchildren, I would argue that you are, you know, on a, on a one to 10 scale of happiness, you're automatically adding three points to it. Um, it, you know, so if there's one thing that I would encourage people to do, it's invest in the relationship that you have with your children and with your grandchildren and figure out the ways to spend as much time and invest in them in the ways that our society is currently not. Ah, that's such a great way to say it. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot in this program about, um, if you go to YouTube and search for interviews with people who live to be a hundred, they all say the same three things uh, in terms of what matters in life. And uh, quality of relationships, particularly those with family, are always number one, Mike. So you, you hit the bullseye on that one. Um, and, and I'll tell you, like, um, uh, having a similar perspective and, and really tried to ask myself, what kind of parent do I want to be in my children's lives? Um, I've seen through my life journey that, that um, when parents can intervene, not enable, but they can intervene and provide just a little bit of a an extra push at just key moments in life, like maybe helping your kids afford getting into their first house or whatnot. Uh, you can oftentimes set them ahead a decade or two 
with with not a lot of investment or not a lot of contribution, but but just being positioned to be able to to, to just give them a little uplift at, at, at these key moments in life, you can serve as a massive kind of um, happiness and life return catalyst uh, for your kids. Um, and again, it's not in a way that enables them or makes them spoiled, but that that's really what I've tried to aspire to become as a parent is, is you know, trying to identify where in their lives I can really help them out. Um, and in, in many cases too, it, it doesn't necessarily even require that much of an outlay, but but over time, it's like a lever point where you give them, a, a, you're really changing their, their future trajectory a lot. Um, by being playing that key role right at that point in time. You're nodding a little bit as I'm saying this, but your point about like investing in them in a way that society isn't, you know, there are sometimes these key moments where a little bit of investment just goes an awfully long way. I, I, I think that's really true. I also um, would caution people for exactly that reason though, right? Um, if you can't afford to do that, be honest, right? And don't encourage your children to go absolutely crazy trying to keep up with the Joneses, whether that's in education or anything else. Um, the simple reality is I was very fortunate that my parents made tremendous sacrifices despite coming from very modest means to give me the best education that money could buy in an environment in which they po couldn't possibly do that. Um, it really hurt my family's outcomes had it not been for the fact that I was fortunate and successful in that framework. But I, I, one of the things I see all the time is people stretching to do that. And, it, you know, I would just encourage people, remember, there is no golden path. There is no certain outcome. You don't need to be part of the elite competition in the same way. The simple reality is if your kid wants to be a plumber, encourage them to be a plumber. Don't encourage them to be a philosophy major because you think that a college degree is the answer, right? It's not. The answer is to be close to your children, to give them your life guidance, and to position them to be successful in every way possible. Adam gave one example with just the little, you know, levers that you can provide them with. Um, make sure you're not putting millstones around their neck with expectations as well. I, I've, I've, I've seen many parents guilty of, of, of what you've just said, Mike, which is um, uh, they, they want to help their kids so much that they're sort of stealing from their own retirement. And then they end up basically becoming a, a burden on their kids. Yep. And end up, everybody ends up losing, right? So you want to make yep. sure you avoid that. And on the other end too, is is to use my example of helping your kids get into a house, you know, help them get into a house that makes sense for them, that they can afford, right? What you don't want to do is, is help your kids stretch themselves ridiculously to get into some house that today is record on affordable prices. You've, you've put in what you can, and now your kids are chained to this mortgage that they really can't afford going forward and God forbid housing prices ever correct, you know, then it becomes a, to your point, a real millstone around their neck. So you got to do this uh, conscientiously and wisely. Um, but if you do it right, everybody wins. Yes. No, we are in complete agreement on that. All right. Well, look, Mike, uh, fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for coming on. It's always a total joy to talk, talk with you. Um, as again, as I said, uh, anytime you're, um, your dashboard is telling you something that you think is important that you want to get out in the world, uh, you got an open invitation to come back here on the program anytime. Um, really enjoyed it, brother. Thanks so much. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you for having me, Adam.